dans la guerre mondiale qui est en cours, la France a été vaincue à l'avant-garde de la liberté. Charles de Gaulle, titan of the French Fifth Republic, once famously said, No nation has friends, only interests. A foreign policy sentiment so realist in nature that it made Bismarck blush, this approach toward international relations was put into practice by de Gaulle during his tenure as a statesman and president of France. Under his so-called politics of grandeur, he stressed the primacy of France above all others, especially on the European continent. At the height of the Cold War, a time in which France found itself caught literally between the liberal forces of Washington and the communist forces of Moscow, de Gaulle pursued his realist foreign policy without hesitation. Denying the United Kingdom entry to the common market of the European economic community, the forebearer of the European Union, and pulling France out of the military structure of NATO were just a few of his more bolder foreign policy decisions. France under his leadership was able to retain a significant level of autonomy in the realm of foreign affairs, using its strong position on the continent to achieve its own political ends, even those that did not necessarily mold well with the interests of Washington or Moscow. In contemporary international relations, such a break with the unipolar American world order is cause for concern and the subject of speculation by both pundits and policymakers alike. Incredible amounts of funding and time are given to think tanks whose purpose is to identify and analyze these so-called problem children of the world, the Irans, Syria's, North Korea's, China's, and Russia's, to name a few. These countries most definitely do not play by the same rules as everyone else, but instead pursue foreign policies that are oftentimes conflicting with the vested interests of Washington and its allies. These countries are easy to identify and even easier to analyze and talk about, but they aren't the focus of this video. Instead of asking what is to be done about these countries, a far more interesting question to ask is this, where have the Gaullist Francis gone? Obviously, the Gaullist is dead, and France is still more or less around, but where have these geopolitical actors that managed to abide by the American foreign policy consensus while still maintaining their own independent foreign policies gone? Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, these countries are far from being extinct and do in fact exist. But among them, none perhaps draw more interest and intrigue than the Republic of Turkey. Straddling the Anatolian Peninsula and bridging the continents of Europe and Asia, Turkey has long been a reliable ally of the U.S. since its accession into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1952. Admitted alongside Greece, Turkey's unique position gave the U.S. an enormous leg up in terms of combating Soviet influence in the Middle East and Mediterranean regions. But despite these advantages that are afforded to NATO by Turkey's membership in the organization, the country has not been without its own flaws and quirks, especially in recent years. Most notably under President Recep Erdogan, the country has taken foreign policy decisions that confuse some and anger others. Instances such as Turkey's purchase of the Russian S-400 anti-aircraft missile system or its opposition to the Kurdish separatists in Syria are just a few examples of these geopolitical maneuvers that have veering far off the straight and narrow most U.S. allies are forced to abide by. While a case can be made that these decisions are simply manifestations of Erdogan's own unique nationalist approach toward politics, these decisions have made it glaringly clear how important a cooperative Turkey is to policymakers in Moscow and Washington. Even more importantly, the forging of a new independent foreign policy by Ankara is indicative of a Turkey striving to return its, to its historical roots as the dominant geopolitical political actor of the Eastern Mediterranean. Thus, the point of this video will be to examine and analyze how Turkey is using its strategic position to pursue its own independent foreign policy goals in the region. These actions will be juxtaposed next to American and Russian designs on the Middle East, and how Turkey plays a crucial role in seeing that these designs come to fruition. Turkey's dominant position on the Anatolian Peninsula has been a long-established reality of Near East geopolitics. Since the capture of Constantinople from the Byzantines in 1453 onwards, the Turks have used their control of the region to maintain a dominant position over the area in the broader Levantine and Mesopotamian regions. The Ottomans held this position as the Near Eastern hegemon for over 400 years, only capitulating the title thanks to the combined effort of the Entente forces in the First World War. But even after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and the creation of the Turkish Republic, the Turks retained control over the majority of Anatolia, as well as the crucial Bosporus and Dardanelle Straits. As such, while Turkey has lost the Balkan, North African, and Arab portions of its empire, its control over the core region means that it can continue to operate from the same geopolitical framework as its Ottoman predecessors did. But what exactly was this historical geopolitical framework? The answer to this question can be found in the synthesized analysis of Byzantine and Ottoman history by Greek historian Dimitri Kitsikis. A professor at the University of Ottawa, Kitsikis has developed an interesting geopolitical theory known as the Intermediate Region. Kitsikis has argued that whether the empire be that of Darius, Alexander, Justinian, or Osman, the control of the Straits as well as the Anatolian region has been a main characteristic 
of an eternal quote-unquote central empire that has existed in the region of the Eurasian continent in one form or another. The central empire has historically faced continuous conflict with the Occidental and Oriental forces on its periphery. By virtue of its position as a center of the Eurasian landmass, the land that central empire inhabits is valuable for the peripheral nations seeking to dominate Eurasia as a whole. If these peripheral forces were not seeking the outright control of the straits, like the Russian Empire did in the 19th and 20th century, then they sought to co-opt or balkanize the central empire to allow for their own specific designs on the region to play out unabated. It was only the resistance of Turkish nationalists like Mustafa Kemal Pasha, later known as Ataturk, that prevented the ad outright balkanization and partition of the former Ottoman territory. But what of Turkey after the dissolution of the Ottoman state? Even before its destruction, the empire was long derided of, as a sick man of Europe. The loss of its Arab holdings as well as its imperial title were the least of Mustafa Kemal's worries, however. His nation faced encroaching Western power seeking to capitalize on the weakened and exhausted Turkish citizenry. Greek, Italian, French, and British forces all occupied significant portions of Turkey's western and southern core territory, including the crown jewel of Istanbul itself. Turkey would have gone from Near East hegemon to a rump state with little to no maritime access if the Entente ambitions on the region were realized to their fullest. As if this weren't bad enough, Entente forces also sought the creation of an independent Armenian and Kurdish states within the Turkish borders, ostensibly under the guise of Wilsonian self-determination. In reality, these separatists were supported for the valuable buffer territory that they would afford to the newly acquired Anglo-French colonial mandates in the region, against a potential future Eridentist Turkish state. To stop the vultures from circling the Ottoman carcass, Mustafa Kemal committed himself to decisive actions and policies that earned him the honorific, honorific title of Ataturk, meaning Father of the Turks. Under his leadership, Turkish forces were able to drive out the Greeks from occupying Izmir and his administration was able to secure a lasting ceasefire with the other occupying European powers. But it would be Ataturk's reformist policies that would truly transform the former Ottoman nation to a modern and industrialized state. Instituting reforms ranging from the adoption of a Latin-based Turkish alphabet to the secularization of Turkish civil society and governance, Ataturk transformed Turkey from a clerical empire to a secular republic, first among equals in the former Ottoman lands. Taken together, the historical geopolitical framework as defined by the intermediate region, as well as the unique origins of the modern Republic of Turkey, lends itself toward pursuing a foreign policy that is far more autonomous than other countries in the eastern Mediterranean region, and even the world. In this capacity, Turkey's historical origins as a modern state give it the will to pursue a foreign policy not necessarily to the liking of Western powers, while the metaphorical way is the geopolitical framework from which all central empires have operated in the same position. By now you might be wondering what exactly this foreign policy entails, and I'm glad you asked. While Turkish foreign policy has been relatively autonomous since the Republic's founding, it has exerted its geopolitical designs on its immediate region with increasing confidence, especially within the last half decade or so. The most recent foray was the occupation of parts of northern Syria, notably in Operation Peace Spring of October and November 2019. Ostensibly under the pretext of establishing a 20-mile safe zone for refugees displaced during the conflicts in Iraq and Syria, the occupation also sought to dislodge the Kurdish forces who are alleged to have ties to the terrorist PKK organization. Though the or occupation drew criticism from both the Kurds and the Assad government alike, the attack on Kurdish forces is of particular note since it is these same forces that the U.S. has supported and aided during their fight against ISIS and the Assad government. As it would turn out, pursuing an anti-Kurdish policy in the south has Ankara finding itself with odd bedfellows. While Syria and Iran are the most obvious actors in the united front against Kurdish separatism, so too is Russia. While Russia does not contain any significant Kurdish populations within its borders, the importance its assistance has provided should not be understated. The relationship has been so successful for Russia that Turkey has bought the Russian-made S-400 surface-to-air missile system in September 2017, a move that shocked even the most ardent Turkophobes in the West. The purchase of the S-400 can be seen as a clear indication that Turkey will not be constrained to a NATO standardized military, but will instead purchase weapon systems from NATO's largest competitor, that being the Russian Federation. Turkey has also made its presence felt in the Mediterranean, where it has supported the breakaway Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Its support for the state hasn't been anything new, but its implications on the situation on the Middle East are worth considering now that Turkey has committed itself to military operations in the region. An active role in Cypriot affairs is an important asset to maintain, so much so that the United Kingdom continues to use portions of their former territory for military bases. Its proximity to both the battle crown in Syria as well as the strategic Suez Canal give Turkey much needed depth on their southern flank should they decide to conduct air to sea based operations from the island. Turkish ambitions in the Mediterranean don't stop there though. In late 2019, Turkey and the government of National Accord faction 
in Libya signed a maritime agreement delineating a shared maritime zone over which both governments would have exclusive economic zone rights. In other words, the shared maritime zone would effectively be, be under Turco-Libyan economic and military jurisdiction. The agreement immediately resulted in the condemnation from both those in the eastern Mediterranean and beyond, with objections being raised by France, Israel, Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt. The objections raised by Israel, Greece, and Cyprus are of particular note as the shared maritime zone would obstruct the planned East Med Energy Pipeline. Israel and company would need direct permission from Turkey if they were to carry out the project, giving Ankara significant leverage in terms of Middle Eastern energy politics. While the actual ability to enforce such a claim is undoubtedly questionable at best, the move is a clear sign of Turkey's neo-Ottoman designs on its broader periphery. Until its defeats at Italian hands in 1913, Libya was a long-standing Ottoman protectorate territory. This agreement, in conjunction with Turkey's active involvement in the civil war there, is yet another instance of Turkey involving itself in the former territories of the Ottoman realm. Turkey has also exerted its influence in its transfer of refugees and migrants from the Middle East into Europe. Turkey's position as a gateway into Europe made it the main transit hub for those fleeing the chaos and conflict in Syria, Iraq, and even Afghanistan. Since Turkey borders both Greece and Bulgaria, two European Union members, it has allowed migrants to travel through its territory and into the broader EU thanks to the open border policies between member nations. The socioeconomic disorder caused by the migrants has given Turkey a strong position in terms of negotiations, as Ankara has effectively acted as a release valve through which these migrants are flowing into the EU. When contextualized together, these actions clearly demonstrate a foreign policy that is not completely congruent with either Mo Washington, Moscow, or even Brussels. Turkey is a partner with Russia in its fight against the Kurds in Syria, but supports the opposing side in the Libyan civil war. Turkey was once a candidate for EU membership, yet its cunning use of Middle Eastern migrants along with the maritime deal with Libya placed it squarely against local European interests. And finally, Erdogan pursues amicable relations with Putin and even Khomeini, all while claiming to be a staunch NATO ally of the United States. To call these foreign policy ventures contradictory would be an understatement, and yet Turkey has played its hand masterfully. Straying from the traditional role in the Washington-led unipolar world order has made it clear just how crucial it is as an ally, especially within the context of NATO. Conversely, its recent partnerships with Russia have policymakers of Moscow spelling blood in the water. The Kremlin can surmise the potential benefits of a continued cooperation with Turkey and has thus made nurturing a positive relationship a priority. It remains to be seen which path Turkey decides to go down. If someone were to ask you what the most influential book of the 19th century was, you might be inclined to say The Communist Manifesto, or perhaps The Brothers Karamazov. From an American perspective, maybe Uncle Tom's Cabin. Indeed, all these books were influential in their own right, but if I had to choose, I'd pick Alfred Thayer Mahan's The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. An American naval officer and historian, Mahan's 1890 book emphasized the importance of sea control for the construction and expansion of empires, especially those that were colonial in nature. Being that they take up 70% of the Earth's surface, travel via the world's oceans is both cheaper and faster than land-based alternatives. This principle applies not only to the transport of people and goods in an economic sense, but also towards military ends, meaning that a large navy, centered around big gun capital ships, is the most effective means by which a maritime empire can protect and sustain itself. Mahan specifically cited the British Empire's dominance over the seas and trade routes of the world as the main reason for which they enjoyed their role as global hegemon since the defeat of Napoleon on the European continent in 1815. But how was it influential? Well, Mahan's book was particularly well received in Europe, especially by none other than German Kaiser Wilhelm II. Wilhelm, believing in Mahan's theory of sea control and its correlation to imperial power, wanted to achieve Germany's place in the sum by usurping Britain's position as a preeminent global naval power. The British were understandably put off by these plans and took to a naval expansion of their own to counterbalance the growing German threat on the continent. The resulting naval arms race between Berlin and London would have dire consequences, those being the Entente Cordiale between Paris and London as well as the Anglo-Russian Convention. In effect, Wilhelm's pursuit of a naval dominance forced Britain into a position that ultimately broke its long reign of splendid isolation and made them settle various territorial disputes with their chief colonial rivals, those being Russia and France. While it's true that the death of Franz Ferdinand was a spark that set off the powder keg and the ensuing July crisis, Britain's involvement in what would otherwise be a limited European war was essentially guaranteed thanks to the direct challenge Kaiser Wilhelm took up against British naval superiority. The reason I raise the topic of Mahanian naval theory and its impact on the First World War is because the underlying issues surrounding Germany's bid for naval preeminence are similar to those of modern Russia's. Sea power is still the chief method through which power projection and territorial expansion is achieved even today. While the era of formal empire building has come and gone, 
the construction and maintenance of disparate foreign bases and lease ports is still very much in vogue, especially with larger powers such as the US, China, and the United Kingdom. Russia, having been familiar with great power politics since the time of Peter the Great, still retains the capabilities to achieve a similar status of power projection by means of naval efforts. Russian areas of interest are manifold, ranging from the Pacific to the Baltic, but none hold as much relevance to Russian foreign policy today than its involvement in the Middle East. In its simplest form, the competition for preeminence in the Middle East centers on the Turkish Straits and their role as a buffer towards Russian power projection in the region. The Black Sea is the foremost conduit through which Russian maritime power can be projected abroad, and all it takes to know this is a cursory glance of Russian geography. Russia's recent acquisition of the Crimean Peninsula in 2014 has given it a perfect logistical launching pad for naval operations in the Middle East and Mediterranean regions. Other ports such as Arkhangelsk, St. Petersburg, and Vladivostok are either considerable distances from the Middle East, are impeded by straits under foreign control, or are frozen during significant portions of the year. Therefore, control of the Turkish Straits is paramount toward guaranteeing safe passage to the wider high seas. Historically, the Russo-Turkish rivalry as well as Turkish naval power in the Black Sea meant that safe passage would only be achieved through direct control of the sta straits, a goal Russian czars attempted to achieve on several different occasions. Gaining direct control or acquiring safe passage guarantees by cooperative port authority was therefore the ultimate goal of all Russian interactions with the Turks. Lest their ships be shelled in the narrows by land batteries on the Turkish shores, Russian hopes for power projection beyond the Black Sea has been forever tied to the status of the Turkish Straits. As one might expect, the recent cooperation with Turkey has been a boon for Russian expansion into the Middle East, and it is for this reason the Kremlin has continued to cultivate a positive relationship with Ankara. But what does Russia hope to achieve in the Middle East? From the outside looking in, Russian influence in the region appears to be directionless and only geared toward adversarial posturing against the US. Moscow's support for the Assad government in Syria is perhaps its well, most well-known initiative on its part in the region, and is direct defiance of the American efforts to see Assad ousted. But Russia's involvement with Syria did not begin in the 2010s with the subsequent Syrian civil war and pressure from Washington. Rather, the former Soviet Union was a staunch ally of Syria under Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad's father. It was during Assad's senior's that tenure that the Soviet Union leased its largest foreign naval base at Tardis. Since the collapse of the USSR, this base has not only seen its lease renewed for another 46 years, but has also undergone intense renovations and expansions so as to allow larger ships, some with nuclear capabilities. The port provides resources and material to both the Syrian government and the already existing Russian air bases in Latakia and Palmyra, meaning that it serves as a means toward Russian power projection in the inland of the Levant. Its strategic position in the eastern Mediterranean also means that it serves as a solid check on Western influence in the region, namely American influence in Israel and the British bases in Cyprus. In this capacity, Russian influence in the Middle East is as much a means to an overarching end as it is an end in itself. Being that the region sits at the geographic pivot point of the old world, especially the Russian territory itself, a firm presence in the region can open doors toward other periphery areas such as South Asia or Africa, places that Russia would otherwise have trouble projecting its influence toward if it weren't for the solid presence in the region. Russia sees the Middle East as a first chain and a link toward other areas right for Moscow's exploitation. The issue of energy interests shouldn't be discounted either. Russian influences in both Iran and Syria do indeed serve to the end of countering American hegemony in the region, but their implications for oil and gas extractions from the Middle East are of concern to the Kremlin as well. In 2018, crude oil accounted for $134 billion, or 31% of Russia's total exports, meaning that a role as an influential actor in the Middle East is quite to its advantage should it ever decide to influence the OPEC nations there via hard or soft measures. The recent Russian OPEC price war over oil production that occurred earlier this year can be seen as an example of Russia flexing its metaphorical muscles over Saudi Arabia and its OPEC partners. Though an agreement was reached in April, Moscow's initial refusal to limit oil production despite the record low prices is quite clearly a sign of strength on the Kremlin's part and was a leading factor to the initial stock market crash in March, exacerbated of course by the COVID-19 outbreak. The ramifications of Russians in the Middle East go beyond just influence over the price and production of oil, but also has implications as to where the oil flows. It is no secret that a significant amount of European countries are still dependent on Russian energy pipelines. Despite all the rhetoric and efforts to divest, countries like Poland, Ukraine, and even Germany are still heavily reliant on these pipelines to keep their lights on. Low oil prices stifle renewable energy alternatives by offering these countries a cheaper alternative, and a Russian coalition in the Middle East could ex be exploited so as to block any efforts to create pipelines linking the region to the Europe. By exploiting these two geopolitical realities, Russia can keep Europe dependent on its energy and, in doing so, ensure its security on two different fronts. 
all this is not to say that Russia is in a dominant position when it comes to the energy politics of the region, but its own reliance on energy exports coupled with its ability to keep production up despite low prices does mean an increased presence in the region could yield an effective monopoly on future energy, energy disputes, especially if the U.S. ever decides to reduce its commitments to the region. Speaking of the U.S., its commitments and interests in the Middle East are essentially the same as Russia's, meaning that they seek to maintain a coalition of allies who will, in return for American security guarantees, afford them the oil and gas resources needed to drive their economy. Pursuant to these alliances are the issues of energy and balance of power politics. Despite refined oil exports eclipsing refined oil imports in 2011, Washington still has a vested interest in maintaining its network of alliances against Iranian expansion, especially its recent geopolitical ventures against the American allies of Saudi Arabia and Israel. Not only would Iranian control over the Persian Gulf effectively cripple Saudi Arabia's ability to export its crude oil abroad, but it also mean Iran would hold all the cards in terms of energy negotiations going forward, a situation most feared by American policymakers and industrialists alike. But the principal concern of this video is not the machinations of U.S. Middle Eastern policy, but specifically the role Turkey has played in maintaining U.S. local hegemony there. And just like in the case with the Russians, the strategic Turkish Straits hold the answer. Turkey came into the fold of American foreign policy upon its membership of NATO alongside Greece in 1952. While NATO does host a wide range of countries important to materializing Atlanticist goals, none are perhaps more important to preserving the transatlantic alliance in Turkey, if not for the role it plays as a buffer against Russian southern expansion. The Montreal Convention of 1936 affords Turkey the ability to restrict the passage of foreign na naval military vessels of other countries passing through the Straits, effectively giving Turkey the right to turn away Russian military ships hoping to project power beyond the Black Sea. In fact, it was the Turkish Straits Crisis of 1946 that moved Turkey out of its period of post-independence war neutrality and into the arms of Washington. The crisis saw the attempts by the Kremlin to pressure Turkey to either give the Soviet Union joint administration of the Straits or afford it strategic guarantees for safe, safe passage, neither of which Turkey wanted any part of. The resulting U.S. policy to cope with the Soviet's aggression was made clear by then U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson in his correspondence with his French counterpart, saying, quote, In our opinion, the primary objective of the Soviet Union is to obtain control over Turkey. We believe that if the Soviet Union succeeds in introducing into Turkey armed forces with the ostensible purpose of enforcing the joint control of the Straits, the Soviet Union will use these forces in order to obtain control over Turkey. In our opinion, therefore, the time has come when we must decide that we shall resist with all means at our disposal any Soviet aggression, and in particular, because the case of Turkey would be so clear, any Soviet aggression against Turkey. The issue of the Turkish Straits and the dichotomous nature of both Greece and Turkey at the time was so important for American grand strategy against the Soviet Union that it would be the foundation upon which the Truman Doctrine as a whole would be built. In his now famous speech before Congress in 1947, President Truman argued that the recent Turkish Straits crisis, as well as the ongoing communist insurrection in Greece, were of utmost importance for American national security priorities in the region, and thus justify the need to financially and military support such nations attempting to resist subjugation by authoritarian influences. Nevertheless, Turkey now needs our support. Since the war, Turkey has sought additional financial assistance from Great Britain and the United States for the purpose of effecting that modernization necessary for the maintenance of its national integrity. That integrity is essential to the preservation of order in the Middle East. The British government has informed us that, owing to its own difficulties, it can no longer extend financial or economic aid to Turkey. As in the case of Greece, if Turkey is to have the assistance it needs, the United States must supply it. We are the only country able to provide that help. Despite Greece nor Turkey themselves being particularly democratic at the time, the principle of supporting such nations in a bid to contain Soviet influence would be codified in Truman's speech and the subsequent $400 million worth of foreign aid received by both countries. The decision to support Turkey turned out to be a diplomatic masterstroke, as the relationship between Ankara and Washington has borne many fruitful results for both nations. The U.S. gained a southern bulwark that impeded Soviet expansion into the Middle East and Mediterranean, and the Turks gained the support and stability needed to resist the Soviets on their doorstep. Despite hiccups occurring in the relationship, specifically in recent years since the Iraq War in 2003, 
A strong Turkish-American alliance is still very much within the interests of American policymakers if they hope to retain a dominant position in the Middle East. However, a close examination of U.S. policy in the region shows that it is Washington, not Ankara, that is jeopardizing this relationship. The American decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein, coupled with its support for the Kurds, has had serious consequences for Turkey's national security. The resulting destabilization caused by the Iraq War, as well as the Kurdish separatist movement being fermented in Turkey's western provinces and in Iraq and Syria, cannot be, dis cannot be discounted for the effect that they've had in fraying the once strong Turkish-American alliance. Washington's actions in the Middle East have largely been to the detriment of its Turkish allies in one form or another. The resulting instability caused by American exploits in the region have caused both mass movements of refugees into Turkey, as well as insurrectionist groups like the YPG and Islamic State to operate adjacent to Tur sovereign Turkish territory. At best, these groups create instability on the frontier territories, and at worst, they threaten the outright territorial integrity of the nation as a whole. Can American policymakers really be surprised that Turkey would pursue a foreign policy different than Washington's with regards to Russia after all that Washington has done in the region? At the end of the day, Turkey's foremost goal is preserving its territorial integrity and its existence in the face of both internal and external pressures. Turkey's interests are also increasingly being found outside its immediate borders and in the broader eastern Mediterranean region, specifically in the sphere of energy and pipeline geopolitics. These interests also extend toward their involvement in both the Libyan and Syrian civil wars, both of which are being used to project Turkish power into the territories of the former Ottoman Empire. This may be more than just a coincidence, though, especially when one considers the geopolitical framework from which the Turkish state is operating is still identical to that of the Ottomans or Byzantines before them. The concept of a so-called central empire, as well as the uniquely Western orientation the country went through after its war for independence, mean that Turkey is still able to operate on its own terms outside the jurisdiction of Western and Eastern powers alike. Thus, Turkey's foreign policy is becoming more autonomous as its regional influence grows. Now contrast this growing autonomy with the interests of the United States. The U.S. is obviously the dominant regional power in Turkey's neck of the woods, and it wants to remain in this position. Its numerous military installations, as well as its enduring occupations of Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, all serve to project American power abroad and protect their interests in these areas. Typically, these interests are energy-related, but they also serve to bolster U.S.-backed groups such as the YPG in northern Syria or the Syrian opposition themselves. Lastly, American interests in the Middle East are most often jeopardized by Iran and its proxies, meaning that maintaining alliances with Israel and Saudi Arabia is key to building an anti-Tehran coalition and keeping the balance of power squarely in Washington's favor. Washington and Ankara share common cause in their opposition to the Assad government in Damascus, though neither the Trump administration nor Erdogan has actually committed to regime change there. Rather, both Turkey and the U.S. have instead taken the soft support of various rebel groups in Syria, still much to the chagrin of Assad. The two countries also share a mutual interest in the realm of security interests, specifically as it relates to NATO's role in containing Russian influence. Despite the Soviet Union being a thing of the past, Russian designs on the Middle East and the Turkish Straits are still worth considering, especially as the Kremlin reasserts itself in places like Ukraine and Crimea. As for Russian interests, they are as follows. Russia seeks to project its power and secure its interests abroad via its most important naval port, that being Crimea. Given the restricted nature of its few other seaports, Russian power emanating from Crimea is not only the logical choice, but also affects an area of concern to Russia, the Middle East. Russian support for the Assad government is just one of its many interests in the region, with its overall goal being the creation of a coalition of allies to rival that of the Americans. This coalition will be able to assure that Russian energy interests in the region are met. By making matters in the Middle East complicated, the Kremlin can ensure the European markets continue to exclusively favor Russian oil over Middle Eastern alternatives. Despite an intense historical rivalry, Relations between Turkey and Russia have warmed considerably due to their shared interest in neutralizing Kurdish separatists in Syria. While their ultimate reasons are different, this united effort has led to a strong military relationship, which has been further solidified thanks to Turkey's allowance of Russian warships to use the Turkish Straits. Moscow has reciprocated this generosity by selling its famous S-400 anti-air missile systems to Ankara, an unprecedented development which has seen a NATO member purchase military hardware from the alliance's chief adversary. If there is anything to be taken away from this video, it is that Turkey is increasingly becoming able to exert its own national security goals on its neighbors. Whether this is for better or for worse, policymakers should not be quick to condemn these ventures and relegate Ankara to pariah status, but should seek to meet Turkey halfway. From a historical perspective, Turkey stepping into this role as a regional power is a position that they have had since their capture of Constantinople in 1453. It has only been for the past 100 years or so since the Ottoman Empire's fall that Turkey has not taken on this role, meaning that these exploits are not a sudden rise to power but are rather a natural reclamation of influence the Turks have historically had. Thus, for the sake of both local and global security, Turkey should be given the same discretion that other states, a part of the Western alliance, are afforded, such as France and the United Kingdom. 
As for external great powers seeking to make inroads into the region, a strong relationship with Turkey is within their interests as well. For both the US and Russia, a good Turkey policy will be increasingly become synonymous with a good Middle Eastern policy. Mismanaging this relationship would spell the end of an Atlanticist Middle Eastern bulwark for America, and for Russia, a major restriction toward power projection. Since the US currently enjoys the upper hand in the region, it is their game to lose. If the ripple effects that were caused by the Iraq war and the support for the Kurds were of any indication, continued provocations on the part of the Americans will undoubtedly destroy the Turkish-American alliance. The consequences of such an event would be monumental, for, foremostly for the U.S. and its allies in the region. Washington should therefore give careful consideration toward any further exploits in the area, lest they lose their most important regional ally and perhaps their entire local hegemony. Russia, for its part, will most likely try to fray this relationship as much as possible. By pitting allies against one another, Russia can circle the square and achieve the Middle Eastern power projection that both Tsars and Commissars alike have sought since Catherine the Great acquired Russia its Black Sea territories. The pieces are all in place. It is now up to the players of this great game to decide who will reign supreme over the Near East. If you made it this far into the video, I'd like to thank you for your patience and interest in the topic at hand. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. If you enjoy the video, please leave a like. If you want to see more content from me, please subscribe as I plan on making more videos like this in the future. Anyway, take care and see you next time.